The overarching message is that you do what the elite are doing, not what they're saying, right? None, none of them are giving up their opportunities to own assets. And in fact, they're doubling down in many cases on hard assets. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for October 30th through November 6th, 2023, while supplies last. This week we feature three different specials. One ounce silver philharmonics at $3.10 over spot, one ounce platinum kangaroos at $85 over spot, and pre-33 $10 gold liberties in AU condition at $115 over melt. First, the silver Austrian philharmonic is one of the most popular bullion coins in Europe and frequently regarded as one of the most beautiful as well, displaying musical instruments on one side and the famed great organ of the Golden Hall on the other, all in three nines fine pure silver and made by the 900-year-old Austrian mint. 2023 Silver Philharmonic is available at just $3.10 over spot. Next, we have the one ounce platinum kangaroo from the Perth Mint at just $85 over spot. Many consider platinum to be highly undervalued at the moment, since over the last 30 years, platinum has generally been significantly more expensive than gold, but currently sits at less than half the spot price. Best of all, the one ounce platinum kangaroo is just $85 over spot, giving you access to a premier coin in a premier metal at one of the lowest prices in 20 years. Finally, the Gold Liberty is one of the most famed gold coins in history, a physical reminder of the gold standard and hard currency in the United States. Minted from 1838 through 1907, the $10 Liberty offers just under half a troy ounce of gold in a 90% fine coin. These coins are in AU, almost uncirculated condition, and available at just $115 over melt, offering a great way to hold American history at a great price. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're delighted to have a first-time guest today. Carol Roth is the author of a book that should be of high interest to all of our viewers and subscribers. The title of the book, with a provocative title that we should all understand is very important, is You Will Own nothing and i'd like to bring up a copy of the the book right now so you can see that she in the title of the book has included all the things that you will not own in the future that is a house a car a business stocks or your life carol thank you for joining us this first time on liberty and finance yes it's a it's a pleasure to be here with you and i should just clarify up front before everybody hates me is i actually want you to own all of these things <laughs> this is the prediction that uh, that we're talking about so hopefully by the end of reading the book and going through this interview people will own everything so just uh, don't don't shoot the messenger on this one that's exactly right and uh, people who are subscribers to this channel are already on that wavelength um, we've got a lot of concern among our subscribers and viewers about the potential future that is being planned for us by the self-appointed elite. You'll tell us about uh, what those organizations are, or perhaps some of the individuals involved, and how they have laid plans to make sure that it's very difficult, if not nearly impossible, for those of us who would like to have a self-directed future where we have our own sovereignty, our freedom, our privacy, our ability to have property rights, etc., in the future taken away from us and our children and our grandchildren. And we'd like to do everything we can to uh, thwart those plans, to reassert, to refuse to comply with that, and to reassert our rights to natural law, God-given rights, etc., etc., that take care of our own households, take care of our communities, our states, and our beloved countries as well, and basically refuse to comply with these evil plans that are being laid for us. So first and perhaps most obvious question is, what inspired an author such as yourself to write a book called You Will Own Nothing? Well, first, amen to uh, all of the things that you just said there. But in terms of the book, Um, I had written a book during the pandemic that sort of recounted everything that happened called The War on Small Business with HarperCollins. And my editor came back to me and he said, we want you to write something else. And we have all these topics. And I'm like, no, I don't want to write about any of that. What I want to write about is the fact that people are doing all of the right things, yet they feel like they're being left behind. They don't have uh, the opportunity 
to create wealth for themselves and for their family. And so I'm just going to go think about this for a while. And I started kind of going through all of these things that were barriers to our wealth that were creeping up, um, whether that be, you know, informal social credit, whether that be the potential for central bank digital currencies, whether it was the debasement of currency by central banks from around the world, whether it was big tech trying to rent our lives back to us as a subscription or service. Here in the U.S., things like Wall Street competing with individuals to buy single family homes and, and the cost of education, keeping young people at a financial disadvantage. And, you know, I'm looking at all of these things and I'm trying to figure out the through line. And I just couldn't quite wrap my head around it. And then one day it just hit me out of the blue that meme that everyone had seen on the internet with you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. I'm like, that's it. You'll own nothing. And when you think about what, you know, what that says, when you have this group from the World Economic Forum, if you're not familiar with the meme, it comes from their top eight predictions for 2030. Um, you have this group that is littered with the business elite and the political elite. So if they're predicting the end of private property by 2030, um, that's concerning for somebody who knows that the only way that you create wealth is by owning things. And you know, hopefully those things are assets that can retain value or increase in value. And there was sort of a lot more to unpack there. The, the fact that it was you'll own nothing and not will own nothing. <laughs> the fact that they want you to buy in and be happy. And the fact that throughout history, the people who haven't had property have not been happy. They haven't been free. They haven't been wealthy. And in many cases, you know, they've starved or, or lost their lives. So that kind of created this wrapper, provocative wrapper, to talk about the shifts that are happening in the global financial order and how all of these sort of disparate forces, you know, whether it's governments and central banks, whether it's these NGOs or intergovernmental organizations or big business or big tech, how they're all working in their own way and sometimes together to put up these barriers to wealth creation, the same ones that you just mentioned you're working to help tear down, which is music to my ears. Yeah, one of the things that you mentioned along the way there was the ability for people to uh, get ahead. I mean, people feel that sense of treading water and falling farther and farther behind. Uh, if you go back half a century or so, even I'll, I'll, I'll preface this by saying we hear the chant over and over again that the proof of success of of uh, capitalism and the Western way and all this sort of thing is the rising standard of living, the increased life expectancy. You can quote a number of statistics that say, "Gee, it looks like looks like uh, we're doing well by people." So what's the what's the problem? And um, one of the things that uh, has caused a lot of concern, we just got off an interview with Alex Newman from the New American and Epoch Times, and he talks about the importance for parents to be able, if they choose to, to be the primary educators of their children rather than sending them to government uh, schools to get indoctrinated and whatever the, the current fad is. Um, and many people today saying we can't afford to do that. And it's like, well, that's been sold to us as the liberation of half of the potential workforce and the force of people who would have been staying home to be the mothers to the children are now necessarily off in the, in the workforce. And that may be uh, exactly what some of them wanted in terms of fulfilling careers, et cetera, and their aspirations. On the other hand, as my wife often reminds me, how many couples today feel that it's a, they're compelled to be kind of backed into that corner because life has become so unaffordable between, as you mentioned, education expenses, medical expenses, on and on and on. And people don't see the, the source of that at its root as far as the debasement of the currency driving everyone's earning power down earn, and savings down the drain and retirement farther and farther away, et cetera. So really appreciate that you're taking a sort of a cross-cutting view through all of these various phenomenon that people are, are finding as stumbling blocks to their prosperity and their, their, their freedom and uh, finding ways to help people see how they can push back. In fact, I forgot to mention the subtitle of the book is not just You Will Own Nothing, but Your War with a New Financial World Order and How to Fight Back. That's the part that we'll 
try to get to in the second half of the, the discussion today is how we can fight back, how we can refuse or resist to comply with these plans that have been laid for us. Um, as you get in, as you got into this, as you started doing the research for this, um, were there key elements that e emerged to you as, oh my gosh, this is the one, two or three things that are going to be like the pillars of what the problem is that we're facing and how to help people. Before you can show people how to get out of the way of something, you've got to define what this, what this something is. What do you see as perhaps the key uh, concerns or the key elements of this? I think that the question that we all have to answer is why now? You know, if you have all of these organizations that feel empowered to be able to create these barriers, like why is this happening in 2023 in a way that it didn't happen in, you know, 1990 or 1970 or whatever it is? And so this is the part, well, one of the parts that seems very conspiratorial, but what I've tried to do with this book um, is use my background and use sources, as many as I can, from the corporate press and mainstream media to, you know, put their own words out there. Um, to take that conspiracy element out of the discourse, because much of this is not a conspiracy. So this shift, its idea that the new financial world order is going to shift sounds like the ultimate conspiracy, right? New world order, tinfoil hat stuff. But this is basically just history and cycles. <laughs> and so if you think about you know, the United States having the world's reserve currency and being at the center of the financial universe globally, you know, that's something that's only been going on for about 80 years. Now, in my lifetime, you know, that's my entire lifetime. So I don't know any different than that theoretically. Uh, but for when people look back over historical period, that's not that long of a time. Before the United States, it was Britain that was the center of the global financial universe that had the world's reserve currency. Before them, it was the Dutch. And so this is something that changes based on human nature and cycles and the same thing that happened you know, at, in, with the Dutch Empire that happened with the British Empire that's kind of starting to happen here in the United States. And it's things like governments getting really big and overspending and you know, running up debts and a lot of infighting amongst the population and, and so on and so forth. And so the idea that we're getting close to a shift or, you know, and again, close, I can't tell you the exact time because in history, as I said, that, you know, time periods are different than as we're living them day to day. But we all agree, you know, that things are more tenuous financially. You know, in the United States, debt to GDP has exceeded, as we're recording this, 120 percent. Um, the deficit is 8 percent of GDP. You know, the things that are unsustainable and untenable from a financial situation. So, you know, I'm not the only one who's, who's seen this. Many very smart people have written about this. And even the president of the United States has talked about this. Now, we can say lots of things about Joe Biden. That he's a conspiracy theorist is probably not one that comes up in anybody's top, you know, 500 things that you would say about him. So he was in front of the business roundtable, which is the CEOs of all the publicly traded companies in the United States, the biggest companies, March 21st of 2022. And he explains this. He says that the, you know, the financial order flips over every three to four generations, just like we talked about. And then he goes on and says a few more things. And at the end, he says there's going to be a new world order out there and we've got to lead it. Now, again, this idea of we, it's you know him and the business leaders. I'm sure I was not <laughs> included in that thought process. Yeah, as, as George Carlin says, it's a big club and you're not in it. Exactly, exactly. So lo love Carlin and you know he's very, very astute in that particular um, insight. And so you know when you have the president, this is on the White House's website. You can go see the president's talking about a new world order. You can type in Biden new world order. You'll see all kinds of articles. And he's not the only one. So the people who are connected and in the know know that there is going to be a shift coming. So if you are somebody who is powerful and you are somebody who's wealthy and you're in that elite circle, what are you going to do? Are you going to sit back and go, wow, I hope this works out for me. And, you know, maybe as things change, it'll, you know, I'll still be on top. 
or do you work to try to control things so that you can ensure you and your friends and cronies come out on top? I don't think that that's a conspiratorial leap to know that that's how human nature works. So, of course, as these people, entities, elites see things shifting, they're working to make sure they stay on top. And so, you know, I don't suggest that there's a table that everyone's sitting around where you have, you know, Dr. Evil going, ooh, you know, you need to like make sure nobody has anything. But they are worried that things are shifting and that it's not going to work out for them. And so as they protect what they think that they have a right to, if everybody else's freedoms, opportunities, and the like fall by the wayside, they just don't care. And I think that's a very realistic perspective that everybody has to look through. And again, this wouldn't be happening if we had been, if our government had been fiscally responsible, if the Fed had, you know, managed the global reserve currency for both the international community's benefit and the domestic uh, benefit of the citizens of the United States. You know, we didn't have these this crazy debt and deficit. Like this wouldn't be a discussion that we're having. But when you have a balance sheet for the holder of the the global reserve currency that looks like an emerging market balance sheet, and the only thing that's keeping them from a currency crisis is the fact that it's the global reserve currency, and you know that then shows weakness to the world that all these other bad actors are looking to exploit, you can certainly see how things are on more fragile ground and why this would be the the time period where you're seeing more of this happen. It was a very interesting model, I think you proposed, of uh, rather than a centralized or single-sourced conspiracy, that it could be explained or at least understood operationally as uh, kind of the behavior of uh, people who realize that there will be a change coming or appears to be likely a change coming and they want to make sure that they're on the right, where the bread is buttered. Uh, I've certainly, coming from a long engineering career uh, in industry and uh, in, in Fortune 100 companies, seeing that dynamic effect and a smaller scale within each of those companies where you see that kind of that uh, dog eat dog ladder climbing and, and make sure that you're currying favor with the ones you perceive to be the ones where the wind is blowing in what direction so that you come out on top. And and um, I know there's various names for, for that behavior, uh, but it's always painful to be on the lower on the on the totem pole than those who are using that method of kind of ladder climbing, ladder climbing, ladder climbing to try to get Uh, make sure that they're in the favored pool. My wife brings that up to me from time to time and says, what do these people think who are making plans that are uh, against the good of the people in general, against the good of the people of their own country, against the people uh, of the world, whether, and this is obviously uh, treading into difficult waters, but if if it's potential that there are um, illnesses that are that are didn't have to be created, didn't have to be released, and or or cures so called that didn't have to be created or released, and there's things like that that affect basically everyone. Um, then how is that going to end up being a good thing for anyone, even even those who would like to consider themselves the beneficiaries of this uh, this uh, hog pile to the top and their children and their grandchildren? If if it's uh, kind of being the being the top position on what's becoming a looking like it's heading towards a disaster, a dystopic future. Um, did you get any glimpses of that? And maybe I'm jumping ahead too far in the story as far as how it could be an appealing future, the way it really would play out. I can see uh, as an intermediate step along the way, we hear about people who are uh, prophets of uh, climate change saying everyone else should cut their lifestyle down to a fraction of what it is, et cetera. And they're flying on private jets to these big conferences or, or that sort of thing. Good enough for thee, but not for, for me kind of thing. And that seems to work for a while, uh, as long as there's enough to go around or whatever. But eventually when the engine of productivity grinds to enough of a halt that you really end up with this scene that looks like we've seen in a lot of these movies, and that's a whole other topic is why do we keep seeing all these movies of a dystopic future? Um, it, it's not that much of an honor or a pleasure to be on the top of that pile uh, rather than one where it's a thriving, organic, happy, productive uh, society all around the world of free people. So just asked a big, huge question, but I guess that's the question is, do you see us, that that's the vision that's being held by those who wish to be on the top? And do you think it's it's still compelling to be on the top of such a such a dystopic future? 
I mean, you said so many great things there that I, I want to unpack. I think your your corporate analogy is a fantastic. We see that behavior when things are going well, but boy, do we see that accelerate when things are going badly, right? <laughs> that everyone's and in fact, that's probably a really good analogy. I didn't think about that aspect of it is I've seen that then devolve in those corporations where you have that that uh, ladder climbing and, and down kicking type behavior. It The corporation doesn't thrive as it could have were it to be one where it's about everyone thriving together. Yeah. And then if it's going badly, it's about, you know, save me. <laughs> I need to save, preserve myself, self-preservation and too bad for everybody else. So I think that that does give us a really good model to think about. Um, you know, in terms of your broader question, it's sort of like asking me to explain crazy. You know, it's not a mindset that I am in. I mean, I'm a little crazy, but like not crazy like that. And so it is very difficult because it's so obvious. I'm such a rational thinker. It is so obvious to me that these people who are doing these things are really making their opportunities worse but they can't see that. We have this disease of short-termism. And, and one of the key themes, you know, this is a, like a financial, economic, political book, but it's really a study of human nature, I think, at the end of the day. And while we like to think that we evolve as beings, you know, technology evolves, our context evolves, human nature stays very much constant. And that's why you see the same mistakes happen over and over again. And so I do think that this this idea of you know short termism, you know being in a bubble where the people who are around you all have sort of the same, you know, limited, you know, myopic vision makes people sort of distorted, it decouples them with reality. We have a huge issue with being completely decoupled from reality right now. And like, not that everything I talk about is a meme, but in a sense, it, in this particular case, it is again, it's that meme about, uh, you know, hard times create strong men and strong men create good times and good times create weak men and weak men create bad times or hard times. And so, you know, we're in that part of the cycle where there's been these good times and it's created these weak men and you know, they're the ones that end up creating the hard times. And it happens over and over. I mean, the whole concept of shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations exists in every culture. You know, in, in Asia, it's, you know, rice patties to rice patties in three generations because we just keep doing the same stupid stuff over and over again. So I agree with you. I think the trajectory is very dystopian. And I don't think people realize that allowing people to participate in the prosperity and creating more and growing the pie and having that abundance mindset instead of the scarcity mindset is really what's consistent with free market capitalism. It's like the people who say that they believe in free market capitalism don't. They believe in central planning. They believe in winners and losers. And they've been the beneficiary of things like central bank policy temporarily. It's going to end up screwing them, too. But because they've seen in the short term, oh, look, look at you know how well I've done. Let's have more of this. Um, they just they just see that piece of the, the puzzle and the equation. And it's you know, it's very frustrating. I feel like I spent a lot of time like, you know, being like this. This is not how things work. Like there are certain laws like math like you can, they're just they are what they are you know like one plus three equals four like two plus two can equal four but you know seven plus nine doesn't equal four and they just can't get past that and that's where we have to go back and learn the same lessons over and over again because there is a group of people that just believes that they know better this time it's different or that they're you know doing some noble cause which is actually for themselves. And it's funny that you talk about these dystopian novels, you know, in the book, I referenced a Twilight Zone episode with the alien who comes down from Earth and, you know, they decode his book and the title is To Serve Man. And everyone thinks that's so noble until they decode the rest of the book and To Serve Man is a cookbook. So I feel like that's always my lens is, you know, when you hear people say To Serve Man, in the back of your mind, you should be thinking it's a cookbook. 
you uh, you remind us, and, and again, of the corporate culture um, model might be apt again here too, because I think you said it's trying to define what crazy is. There's a certain type of um, megalomaniac or uh, sociopathic behavior that really doesn't care, isn't really capable of caring, is underdeveloped in that way to, and is quite effective at charming and impressing and accomplishing and achieving and um, making advancements on the backs of others and doesn't feel the slightest bit of guilt about it. Can, can I give a shout out to another book there? Uh, this So this has helped me understand things so much better. There's a book very funny uh, by, I believe his name is John Ronson. It's called The Psychopath Test. Short book, humorous, but it talks about the like one plus percent of the population that has these sociopathic and, and psychopathic tendencies. And they do tend to find themselves in the media, in C-level business positions, doctors, you know, certain other areas. And they don't have empathy and they don't have the ability to think about anything other than their own scenario. And that actually does give you a really good insight of why some people behave that way. It may not be everybody, but that's actually an excellent point and a, an excellent read that, you know, one of my one of my favorite books that I've read in a very long time. One of the things that having taking that perspective and I guess considering that, reflecting on that can do is it can demystify some of this to where we feel less powerless in the face of these these powers that can other seem like otherwise seem overwhelming or daunting or it's going to take over our life and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, before we advance, and I, I felt like I'd gotten ahead of myself, so if we could back up and maybe are there a few things along the way that you think in case people haven't been keeping notes, if they haven't been really absorbing all of this that's been going on and they're saying, what What are you talking about, will own nothing? Can you give people maybe one, two, three, four things that seem to be emerging as plans that are being laid for us, whether we like it or not, unless we do something about it, that people should be aware of? This is what our future is being laid for us. Yeah, the number one concern that I have in this particular arena um, our central bank digital currencies. And, you know, if you control the money, you control the people. So if you don't know what a CBDC is, it's basically a fiat currency produced by whatever central bank and you know, related government uh, where they have complete transparency and control. So imagine, you know, any dollar that you have has a microchip in it. And as you go to spend it, they can not only see it, but they can program it to make decisions on what you can do with it. So the functionality at the consumer facing level is things like, hey, we want to push climate agenda. We think cows fart too much. Carol, you've eaten too many burgers. We can't have that because, you know, we can't have all these cows and whatnot. So we're just not let you spend your money. Or they can further debase the currency by making people go into this and say, you know, we're going to give you, you know, 100 digital dollars for every dollar you turn over. And then the, you know, financially illiterate populace goes, oh, my God, it's amazing. I'm going to be a millionaire, <laughs> you know, not realizing it's about the purchasing power, not about, you know, whatever that headline nominal value is. Um and, you know, if they want to control inflation instead of using the tools they have now by, you know, changing the, their purchases of securities or controlling the interest rates, they could literally just stop spending. They want to destruct spending. Sorry, you just can't access your money. So whether it's by their you know, genius mandate or you've done something wrong and it ties into, you know, a more formalized social credit system, you know, as horrible as fiat is and we should all hate it and you know lots needs to be done there this is like taking it and like putting that on steroids and i do think it'll be the end of freedoms and create all kinds of issues so you know I, i'm i'm hopeful it doesn't happen my second hope is that if it does happen it's for an interim period of time until everyone freaks out but i do think people need to be prepared like if you you earn money and you have it in this form factor that they control, what are you going to do? And I don't know that people have gotten there. Some people, I mean, certainly I'm sure part of your audience, but not everyone, majority of people have not kind of gotten there mentally. Like, oh my God, like I earned this, it should be mine, but it's not really yours. 
And, you know, we've seen them, you know, debase it and, you know, take away your purchasing power. But this is just sort of a new level of, you know, nefariousness, if that's a word. Um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, that's probably the no, the number one thing that I think people need to be worried about. There's so many aspects to that that we don't realize and because we haven't thought it through as deeply as the people who are planning some of these systems. Uh, but we can make analogies maybe to things that we already are starting to experience the first tastes of and go, oh, imagine that carried to its fullest extent. For example, the fact that you used to be able to hold silver and gold coins in your pocket or in your purse and that was what you had earned and it would keep stable value over over decades or centuries or down to your next generation and you could basically take that stored effort that stored part of your life that you gave up to earn that and and bring it forward with you in time for your own need or opportunity or your children or grandchildren in the future and that is what fiat unfortunately corrupted as you pointed out it's not a perfect system by far although although you do have the opportunity something that i um espouse that you 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 consider um is that you do have the opportunity to purchase gold and silver with those fiat dollars as a store of value in a form factor you can control so there there is there are these little places where we can push back, but you're right that mo- that used to back the money and and ensure that the value was not corroded by these entities. Yeah, and then you mentioned um, uh, being able to. Oh, you said uh, it, they would have complete transparency, and I thought, ooh. Uh, that's the way they'll sell it. They'll sell it as transparent so that so criminals can't hide. What you didn't say, which it was the one, what I was thinking was, you won't have any privacy. They'll they'll basically steal your personal privacy. Um, one of the things else you mentioned about a subscription, sell you, selling your life back to you as a subscription because you really can't really own anything. People have come to realize that they say, well, people say, do you rent or do you own? And they go, oh, I own. Okay. Oh, really? Really? Do you really own your home? Uh, so what happens if you decide you're going to, you know, not continue to continually pay your uh, property tax every year? Well, the, the sheriff will help you move away because you don't really own, you don't really hold the, the deed to your actual uh, property. Or how many of our possessions, our car decides whether or not it's going to open up when I walk up to it in the morning based on how it, how it interprets the code on my chip-based fob or whatever that I've got. It's not like I, and then I get into it and it decides whether it's going to start or not. It's going to decide whether I can open up the back lift gate or not. It's going to decide whether or not I have to put my seatbelt on and, and everything. Uh, if I were, heaven forbid, to be stopped by the authorities, I would probably be able to tell them how back, how I've been, how I've been uh, traveling at what rate of speed for the last, whatever, three months or something. So even the little silly printer I'm pointing at across the room here, it, it asks me, at least it asks me, I don't know if it's telling me the truth. Should, does it want me to phone home to the uh, it to phone home to the mothership to order more ink for me when it gets low, or, or does it want me to take care of those things for us? So all these smart things that are in our lives seem to be, we now it's the pay-as-you-go plan. You have to keep paying. So how can you own something if if you have to keep paying it, and it's deciding for you, or somebody who's pulling the string is deciding for whether you get to use it or not? The last part of your uh, message here, I think, is about how we can resist this, how we can take up our our part of this battle for freedom, for privacy, for sovereignty in our lives. Um, can you give us some starting points? I think you already hinted at one as far as own real things like gold and silver. That's something we talk about a lot on our channel. Um, other things in addition to that that you would think people should seriously consider starting now if they haven't already? Yeah, so I think that the, the overarching message is that you do what the elite are doing, not what they're saying, right? Not, none of them are giving up their opportunities to own assets. And in fact, they're doubling down in many cases on hard assets. We know that wealthy and central banks are, as you said, buying precious metals. We know that you know some of the most elite are buying productive land, whether that be farmland or for water rights or ranches or timber or whatnot. Um, we know that <laughs> Wall Street is buying up houses. You know, everything that you know, they tell you you shouldn't want because it's you know more convenient. You have to worry about it. Just say no. And and the line that you draw in is this an asset that will can store value or hopefully appreciate in value. And you know the home is a challenging one because yes, there is this property tax issue, which I do think uh, we have so many issues to deal with. But I do think that's like on my radar of something that needs to be fought. Um, but <laughs> you still not owning your home gives up the biggest um, wealth 
creator on Americans balance sheets and frankly, most places around the world as well. So, you know, that is a way that people create wealth and you do need to pay for living. So, you know, are you going to put it into something where you can retain some value or are you just going to throw all those dollars? And that's a, you know, calculation you have to do, but it's an important calculation. But there's also not just the wealth piece of that, there's the the sovereignty piece of that. Um, and we talk about like, you know, the car that, you know, rats you out to the authorities and things like that because you don't actually own every aspect of it. Well, think about if, you know, some Wall Street guy is your landlord and they want to you know replace all of the gas, you know, the, the gas stoves with electric stoves and they don't want people to have guns or whatever it is. I mean, that can all be written in to your rental agreement. And if you don't have ownership, you don't have sovereignty and agency you know, under your roof, then you're subject to somebody else's rules. And I think as this sort of insanity goes along, we're going to see a lot more of that. And we already know that you know, these people are all in the same inner circle together. So it's much easier if you know the, the government wants to affect change to just go to Wall Street and say, hey, you know, we've been benefiting you with our monetary policy. Do us a solid on this. And, you know, let's let's start getting this you know, worked, work through the system. You know, that that's how ESG happened. Right. I mean, that's we, we've seen this over and over again. So being able to do what you want to do in your own home. And yet there's always some sort of exception. But for the most part, I think is really important. So it's something you should consider. So, yeah, anything that is that hard asset and you can think about your business. You can think about, you know, stocks, if those are right for you. You can think about the precious metals. You can think about productive land. You can think about homes. For some people, it may be collectibles. But just like, look, what are, what are those wealthy people doing who are so worried right now? And I would imagine that those are going to be the, the last bastions, um, you know, that are touched. And it's what, one of the reasons why, you know, one of the things we talk about, I brought in an estate planning expert. because. You are going to hear more. We're going to put it right now. You're going to hear more about various kinds of wealth and inheritance taxes. So whether it's a tax on unrealized capital gains, other wealth taxes, inheritance, the governments are struggling. They don't have the means to pay for the spending. And so they want to get after the middle class's money. And I say the middle class in particular because the people who are very wealthy, again, they're all the friends, they're going to have the loopholes and the tax accountants and the lawyers to get around this. And it's going to be that bulk of the money sitting with the middle class that they're going after. So we can't guarantee what's going to happen. But if they figure, well, you don't have an estate plan, you haven't put your money into a trust or whatnot, maybe we'll grandfather that in for a while. That's probably your best guess at trying to protect your assets by following those same kinds of things that the most wealthy and wealth connected are going to do and just hoping that that will get grandfathered in for some period of time. So I, I think that's really important. Yeah, it, it sounds it has the ring of truth to it. Unfortunately, a lot of those, as you mentioned, a lot of those trust structures and legal structure, all that sort of thing, it becomes so Byzantine in its complexity that the ordinary person feels utterly hopeless at being able to truly understand it. They hand over complete uh, accountability of that to their advisor, whether that's a financial planner or a trust attorney and all that sort of thing. And now you've got this ring of advisors up there and it starts to feel like you're in a Kafka novel where the things that, that are being uh, the circle of your life, your life has become too complex, don't worry you're not qualified anymore to be a to be a functional uh, agent in your own life you just you just keep working they make it opaque on purpose they do make it opaque on purpose because they don't they want you to feel like that but there are some fairly sim more simple structures so don't sign anything you don't understand just make them keep explaining it until it's done and if, if you don't have an advisor who can explain it then it's not the right advisor find another advisor and by the way like one of the things you should be asking i get this question all the time is you know, does your advisor understand these broader issues? Um, and some do and some don't. And some will laugh at you and some will go, OK, like, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from. And so find those you know, like minded advisors. Three things. One, where can we find your book? So the book is available wherever fine books are sold. Um, I always plug if you can buy it from a local small business bookseller. That's always great for your community. 
But if you're, you know, lazy, buy it off the internet. <laughs> Second thing, where can people follow your work? So um, I am across social media, but most active on Twitter with a handle Carol J S Roth. I have a financial newsletter that you can, well, actually a personal newsletter that you can sign up for at carolroth.com slash news. And then in partnership with Goldline, I do an economic newsletter. So if you go to either my Twitter feed or you go to goldline.com and look for Carol Roth, you should be able to sign up for that there. And uh, and one other thing, if you're really into preparing, I have a legacy and wishes planning system called Future File. Um, that's a hundred bucks, gets all of your affairs, helps you get all your affairs in order. And that's at futurefile.com. So lots of stuff. Well, and the third question is not fair to put you on the spot, but we're, I was going to ask you, how soon can we have you back on? We'll ask that <laughs> off the air. So anyway, it's been very interesting, very exciting that you're doing this. People take a sharp look at You Will Own Nothing by Carol Roth. Carol, thank you for joining us this first time on Liberty and Finance. Yeah, thank you for having me. And thank, for, thank you for such um, insightful questions and, and interaction really gave me, me a lot to think about as well, which I love. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we can let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, Metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.